Fuse Congruence. This is episode 38 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Yes, welcome. Uh, and you said again. Um, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm like, a, I'm like your ball and chain, it seems. I know. I think people are hoping now for, for what... It's, it's like suspense. We're building up. Like, is, are we going to continue? Am I going to have a new co-host? Exactly. Joined by Pervez again. Yeah, exactly. You're going um, yeah, to be replaced by the, the Cindy. There you go. <laughs> was it Cindy? It was Cindy, right? Uh, yeah, Chrissy. Replaced Chrissy. Yep, exactly. Yeah, and then Terry came at the end. I love how we're talking about Three's Company on, a, on uh, the American Muslim Experience podcast. Because it's totally pretty, random. Totally yeah. random. During uh, Ramadan, in, of course. In Ramadan, of all. Of all. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, well, uh, well, thank you, Pervez, for, for jumping on. Oh, no, it's great. Uh, it's good to be back and um, good to be here. Well, and, and uh, thank you to our guest uh, for this episode. And this is, this is exciting because this is a conversation I've been wanting to have for a while. Our guest is Zarka Nawaz, who is probably very well known to the listeners of this uh, podcast because she is the creator of Little Mosque on the Prairie, the world's first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West, and that aired on the CBC in Canada from 2007 to 2012 uh, for over 90 episodes. Mm-hmm. Her current work is a best-selling comedic memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, which is about growing up as a Canadian of Muslim faith, and it's also about her lack of dating, marriage, and burying the dead. Zarka, thank you so much for coming on Diffuse Congruence. Oh, thanks for having me on, you guys. So just to start things off, now, you you are a Muslim in a quote-unquote non-traditional Muslim field. Yes, I would say. Well, I mean, I'm hoping it's becoming more traditional as the time goes by. Well, I, th- and, I mean, I, I think you were kind of uh, the leading edge of, of what's been uh, um, a very steady growth in that direction. But I think you were way out front uh, in, uh, of a lot of other people. 2007, yeah, probably. <laughs> but the great thing is, I think it gave a lot of people, um, you know, courage and hope. And and now when I go to conferences, so many parents come up to me and say, I'm so disappointed my child chose medicine. I really thought that they would be <laughs> which I think is great. Well, I mean, let's talk about this. So, so we'll definitely get to uh, what, how Little Mosque came into being, but uh, how did you decide that this was the, the field that you wanted to go into or this was the path you wanted to take? Before you jump in, Zarka, sorry, I was just going to say, just before you jump in, kind of like maybe take us a little back, you, you, like you mentioned, parents coming up to you, kind of tell us maybe a little bit about your own background, like obviously you live in Canada, subcontinent background, kind of like maybe give us a feel for, and our listeners a feel for where your um, origin story lies. Well, my parents um, were Punjabi, so we're like the, you know, and as most tribal Pakistanis, they take great pride in being pure jut. You know, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what that means, but <laughs> pure blooded. <laughs> but I was thought the Punjabis were like the craziest of the South Asians. Is that racist? Well, it's, Anyways, like, it's like the Seinfeldian uh, Jewish dentist story, right? So, like, it's okay for you to say that, but not for me, for example, as a non-Punjabi, right? Yes, we're very, we're very, we're very, we're really emotional, high-strung bunch. <laughs> and so, as a result, my father was um manic, like a lot of you know, immigrant dads about their daughters becoming doctors. And, and he was a weird sort of pseudo Gloria Steinem feminist without realizing it. Cause he's like, you know, if you could become a doctor and make tons and tons of money, you'd never need to get married because marriage is for women who fail in life. And, and he grew up with this really strange upbringing. And of course my mother would really not appreciate the sentiment, but you know, from his point of view, he had seen all his sisters and, female relatives get married really young back home and not have 
sort of opportunities that he felt they were smart enough to pursue. So, you know, every time we meet someone that come over to our family, he'd say things like, oh, you know, she's so smart. She has a master's. If only she hadn't married him, she could have had a PhD. Those babies ruined everything. He would always lament. It was always this lamenting going on in the house about how she could have been a surgeon or she could have, you know, she was a doctor in Pakistan, but she came here and she didn't have a chance to do her exams. And now she's got children and it's over. Like he, it was always this tragedy, you know, women getting married and having babies was always a huge tragedy in our family right like that's sort of the thing you grow up with and it's a really strange way of growing up because he's a really conservative muslim man right and so he believed that going to school and getting this education would be the way out from i guess and he never say it but it was patriarchy right it was always true sure. patriarchy and so but you grow up like sort of being driven beyond madness to like succeed because something horrible will happen to you if you right. don't succeed. And so you grow up with this incredible drive. So then when you actually do apply to medical school and you don't get in, it was really traumatic. Like I look back, I, I'm surprised I survived that moment in my life sure. because it was so, so much drama, you know, trying to get into medical school and then not getting in. And then even he was shocked that like he didn't know what to do, right? Because what happens, and of course, my mother, like, you know, was waiting for the, her, it was her Jane Austen moment, like, oh my God, her ovaries are drying up with all this talk about PhDs and <laughs> surgery. We have to like get her married quickly. And so she kind of swooped in. And that was perfect, right? Because it was what I needed to sort of smarten up and say, okay, I can't lick my wounds forever. Like you have to pick up the pieces and pick another career, which was like, but what, right? Like what career do you pick? Because no one ever gives you a, um, a, a plan B, right? What to do if you don't get into medical school? Because it was like never allowed, you were never allowed to think about that option. It was never. And so, you know, my friend, my best friend Rahat was always talking about going to journalism and writing books and novels and television. But that was sort of like, you know, like you were saying, very non traditional. And I, and I just didn't have any role models and there was like nothing out there for me to look at. And so it was. You know, but, you know, if I didn't do something quickly, I knew what my mother was planning. So I applied to the journalism school at Ryerson in Toronto. And I was really fortunate um, to have gotten in. And it literally like changed the entire, you know, directory um, of my life. Wow. So did you grow up? Did you grow up in Toronto or the outskirts of Toronto? Yeah, I grew up in Brampton when it was white. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like <laughs> there are no more. I, I mean, I'm sure there are some white people, but now there are so many South Asians that have moved in. Um, it's actually considered a joke if you can spot a white person. But when I grew up in Brampton, it was very, very white and you know not ethnically diverse at all, and very sort of a difficult place to grow up in in terms of sort of the racism and the bullying. So, so it was okay. a tough, tough. Yeah, it was a tough gig growing up in you know a really white city. Um, the parents were really conservative and you know had only one agenda. So, I mean, you know, uh, I imagine we, we, we obviously have listeners in Toronto, um, but, uh, you know, just for, for at least for me, having only visited a couple of times, um, what are some, like, is, is sort of Mississauga and places like that, the more ethnic enclaves and places like you're talking about are more sort of like, you know, sort of waspy? Yeah, Brampton was really waspy when I grew up, so super waspy. So, you know, it sort of helped... Um, solidify the Muslim community because you needed to kind of come together and there was a mosque and you know that's where the first mosque was established in the first communities and and you know you were trying to figure out who you were as a kid because you clearly were being rejected by your society and and sort of you needed a sort of a safe space to be in and, and that's where we sort of started you know coming together and forming our Muslim identities and then Isna started and then the Minna camp started and we started going to you know Ohio yeah. and that's you know, we sort of like blossomed in these Islamic camps and realized there were places where you felt like you could fit in and that people recognized you. And you sort of, you know, you sort of got confidence in who you were as a Muslim and you could kind of go back home and sort of establish, you know, like Islamic camps and conferences. And that's what we did. And it sort of helped us forge a Muslim identity. Um, and it was sort of a great, you know, I look back in my childhood and going to those camps and conferences and I mean, were huge in terms of informing, you know, who we were as Muslims and finding our place and and becoming more confident in our in our worlds. Right, absolutely. I, I mean, I I, sh I kind of share that growing up ninety or, or I guess sort of growing up in a sense of um, 
uh, finding my identity, I guess you would say, in, in the 90s, vis-a-vis those MENA camps and ISNA and all that stuff. So, yeah, you're, you're kind of very much speaking my kind of generation, I guess, you know? You know, they were great. They were invaluable to us. Mm-hmm. So, so you, you, you're you studying uh, journalism now, um, and then you um, finish that, and then kind of what are you thinking about in terms of, like, a career then at that point? At that point, so I finished journalism, and I thought I was going to be this international, you know, <laughs> I was going to be this you know, roving Anderson Cooper type journalist, and it was going to be amazing, and I was going to conquer the world and work for CBC, which is like, I guess... Um, like a big broadcast, like, you know, CBS or whatever in, in the United States. I remember I had all these really amazing dreams. And then I worked for Peter Zosky, who was huge. He was like the biggest radio broadcaster in Canada at CBC at the time. And I was doing all this research for him. And I was watching him, you know, make all this magic on air. He would take all the research, you know, we would do as researchers. And, and that's when I realized that that I wasn't enjoying journalism as much as I thought I was going to do. I think it, it was more theoretical than practical. And when I was doing the practical, um, there was something missing. Like I, I felt like there was this creative energy that I had that I couldn't make it come out as a journalist. And since so I realized that I had actually made, made a mistake, I should have gone into film and to film school. And, and I realized, Oh my God, I just did a journalism degree. And I cannot go back now and do another degree. Um, because it was just too exhausting. I did four years of science, two years of journalism. And so I asked a friend, how do you know if you're good enough to make films or you, you're good enough to tell a story? And he said, why don't you just take a three week summer film workshop at the Ontario College of Art? That way you'll just do a really quick, you know, short film and then you'll know. And I wanted, at first I thought it was going to be like, you know, I was going to make a five minute film about hijab and the importance of hijab. You know, I, was, I, was, I was so earnest, you know, growing up. And then, <laughs> then, the, then the Oklahoma bombings happened in the U.S., um, I believe it was like 1995, if I'm not mistaken. And all these Muslims were being taken off airplanes. And I think like, you know, five minutes later, they arrested Timothy McVeigh. And, and who knew that there were these anti-government terrorists running around in the U.S. blowing up federal sure. buildings? Hundreds of people. I think that was one of the big terrorist incidents in the United States. And I thought, wow, you know, like what what would make people look at one group? And then it turned out to be someone who was American, you know, as apple, you know, as American as apple pie. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to make this five-minute um, short film about um, stereotypes of Muslims. So I, you know, wrote this, I wrote this five-minute film, and I got my brother and his best, and his friend and the neighborhood, you know, to to act in it. And then all of a sudden, all the actors were starting to ad lib and add to my dialogue, and it became a comedy. It became this um, satire huh. without me without, without me really realizing that I had written a satire, but the actors had recognized it. And added their own, you know, comedy. And then when I submitted it to the Toronto International Film Festival, they were like, wow, this is like, this is such a badly made film. Because it's like a student film, right? You can just imagine. We were all students sure. using my parents' like bedroom. And they're like, you know, the, the person who accepted the film was very honest with me. He's like, oh, my God, you know, we're going to get in so much trouble for rejecting these technically perfect films for this piece, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> but no. Nobody else is doing satirical comedies about Muslim and terrorism, and we can't not like, recognize the originality of this, even though it's so terrible, right? Sure. <laughs> so they actually programmed it, and it sort of, again, it was one of those things that I didn't realize at the time, but it sort of changed the direct, you know, trajectory of my life, because once you get programmed into something, some, you know, in a place so prestigious, and that you can now apply for funding for other projects and that having that line on your resume, you know, programmed at the Toronto International Film Festival. So then I went on to make a second um, film, Death Threat, which was about the whole issue of fatwas and death and comedy and Salman Rushdie and the whole obsession with um, writers and the media. And that I actually was able to cobble together um, through arts grants in Canada, about $30,000. So I was able to hire actors and professional crew and what it takes to actually make a proper short film. And again, that was programmed, you know, two years later at the Toronto International Film Festival. And I guess it was, you know, through serendipity and people who supported me and recognized the work and what I was doing without even me understanding what I was doing. So this is, we're talking early 2000s by now? Yeah, I would say by the time, I, I should really put these things on, on I should really, like I, I 
have once seen them. I mean, if you really know me well and you've seen these films, no one really knows what I'm talking about. But everyone's always telling me to put them on my website. And I think I will. I'll figure out. I'll get someone who's 12 years old to figure out how to do that. Sure. <laughs> and put them on so people can actually see this. So the progression of the work. But yeah, so that was very early, like late 1990s, early 2000s. So from from then to... So, so uh, Little Mosque uh, premieres in 2007. What was the development process of that show? And... and uh, did did the the seedling originate with you, or did somebody come to you and say we want to develop a show like this? What happened was it, it was interesting. Like after I finished my two comedies, the National Film Board of Canada approached me and they said, you know, you notice that you're making these comedies, you're starting to get recognized. So we'd like you to do something for us, but we do documentaries. Can you do documentary? And I had never done documentary, but luckily for me, I had the journalism degree, so it did come in handy. Sure. And they said, pick a topic. And so, you know, at this point, I had done two comedies, one about terrorism, one about, um, you know, fatwas and, and the obsession with Salman Rushdie and the whole issue of writers getting sentenced to death. But th- at that particular point in history in my life, I had moved to, you know, I, I had gotten married and I moved to Saskatchewan um, where my husband grew up and we were going to a mosque and it was like, you know, typical mosque. Everyone got eaten. It was a very small community. Everyone knew each other. There was a sense of camaraderie. And then one day sort of this imam from Saudi Arabia showed up and he's like, oh, you know, you know, because the women sat in the same prayer hall as the men. And there was, you know, a lot of, and said, uh, you know, a sense of community. And he was like, no, there should be a curtain. There should be a curtain put up. This is wrong Islamically. And he started making us all second guess what it meant to be, um, Muslim community, what it meant to have women in the community. And so one day I came in and there was this big shower curtain thing strung up in the main prayer hall. And it was really, really traumatic for me because this was the first time I had sort of experienced this feeling that that as a woman, it, I, it was a problem being in the mosque and that I shouldn't be seen. And um, the community was very confused about this process, you know, and we didn't realize it at the time, but it was, you know, the, the Wahhabi vacation of the mosque, I guess, what was happening. And I started talking to people about this issue and how it was affecting other mosques, other communities. And it was an issue that was coming up, you know, throughout North America. And I thought, well, we need to talk about it, right? Because if this is not actually what was going on during the time of the Prophet. Women used to, you know, sit in the main prayer hall and we didn't have curtains in front of us why is it starting now why are are we led to believe that it's the correct interpretation of islam and so that's what i chose as my subject matter for um the documentary so i called it me in the mosque and i traveled around and i realized that a lot of the problems were coming from i guess imams who had studied in sort of these kind of deobandi or wahhabist kind of mentality schools where it was very much women you know, need to be hidden and not be sort of a vital force of the community. And so that was where the seed developed in my mind that what if the mom was born and raised in Canada and the issues of gender equality were very much part of what he thought about a mosque and what he wanted the mosque to be? How would that change things? And so then, you know, we I was supposed to um, go to the Banff Television Festival in Banff to, to launch the documentary. And I asked a friend of mine, like, what do people normally do at this festival? And she goes, well, actually, normally this is a festival to pitch television shows because this is where all the heads of the networks come and producers come. Sure. And so she gave me a template of how one, you know, makes a sitcom outline. So I used it and I sort of plugged in all the main characters that you see now on Little Moss, you know, Amar and Ryan and Yasser and Sarah and all these characters. And I sort of made this fictional mosque and what would happen to all these characters if the imam was actually a lawyer and decided to leave law school and become an imam so that he would have both a secular and a religious education and sort of an outlook of sort of gender equality and, and Islam simultaneously. And how would that change the whole dynamics? This is my working out the issue of, you know, what was happening in my community, in my mosque. Right. And so that's where the idea of the mosque on the prairie came from. And so I was, you know, talking to people about this and later on someone told me, um, you realize that you're getting all the attention at the Banff Television Festival, that you are being taken seriously. And again, I didn't realize that that was happening because it wasn't my intention actually to make a TV show. I was just doing it so I wasn't wasting time at the Banff Festival. Oh, wow. Because I was there for three days. I didn't want to be there for three days wasting my time. And so this was sort of my way of just kind of 
it was there all theoretical because at that time in the early 2000s canada wasn't known for sitcoms we ourselves felt as a nation we weren't capable of doing it because our you know we tend to always get taken over by the americans we watch all american shows so we hadn't really made you know homegrown television in that way before and so no one was actually taking sitcoms or making sitcoms seriously as a thing that we did and yet it was taken seriously by the cbc and you know, one thing led to another and suddenly we were on television and it was a massive hit that no one expected in a million years. And, you know, because we are like NPR, we are funded by the government. And so there's always the, the constant debate in our country. Should CBC be funded? You know, no one's watching it. It's like not relevant to culture in Canada. And all of a sudden the show comes out of nowhere and everyone's watching it and people are talking and it made the CBC relevant and sort of, you know, extinguished all those arguments that we shouldn't have CBC and it wasn't really doing anything good for the country. And so that was a joke that, that the comedians at the time were saying that Muslims, you know, in fact had saved the CBC because we were known for, you know, destroying things. And yet we were the ones that had been responsible for resurrecting the relevance of, of the television um, industry in Canada. So you, you proposed the show and how, how much of an uphill climb was it to, to get them on board. I mean, from what you're describing, there was there was initial interest, but you know, the, the, what, obviously, uh, there's there can be a long runway between initial interest and actually uh, executing the, the the premise. You know, I was really fortunate because at that point, CBC was going through a turnover in executives, and the new executives had wanted something exciting and different and innovative. And so what had happened, all these executives got fired. Every television show that they had ordered was removed, except for us. We were the only ones they hang on to from the previous regime because it seemed really different to them. And they felt that, you know, post 9-11, people were talking about Muslims. We were in the zeitgeist. So that was their reasoning was that this was very different and people wanted to talk about Muslims and what better way to talk about Islam and Muslims but through a comedy. And so it was like, it was like the perfect setup for them at that time. And I think they realized that they had something very different um, on the agenda that nobody else had. And so looking back now, I, I realized that we were very fortunate because people, you know, work for years and years and years trying to get a television show made. And this was, you know, I had had no experience in television. I had no history in television. Um, CBC hadn't had a hit in 20 years. And so we wow. all took a chance on each other. It all came together very quickly. So uh, did, I mean, would you say that your lack of experience was almost something that helped you? It's kind of like fortune favors the, the bold where you, you had no idea of how many uh, limitations you might face. So you just barreled ahead. Yeah, it was good and it was bad. Um, I can, it was good that I had no idea how hard television was going to be and how, what the next you know, couple of years of my life were going to turn into. So that was good. I was glad I didn't, you know, because had I known just what it would entail, I think it would have been really scary. And I mean, the bad part was that I, you know, I didn't have experience writing sitcom in a room ever before. And so it was, a, you know, it was a steep learning curve for me being in that room with more experienced writers who sort of looked at me, you know, and there was a lot of jealousy because they had been trying so hard for years to get their own television show off the ground. And suddenly I show up with no experience, no history, nothing, and, you know, make this monster hit. So there was the, dealing with that issue. Wow. But, know, I mean, it was a learning curve, right? Someone said to me, just keep your head down, because what other opportunity are you going to get to sit in the writing room doing 20 episodes a season? Because you, what you will learn is the training you will get is unprecedented in story writing and comedy writing. So it's sort of you made up for all the stuff that you never you didn't have time to do when you were going through school. And one one sort of fell swoop. That's right. Um, you know, I think one of the fascinating things that I um, that you kind of mentioned um, just about the um, sort of homegrown, um, I guess, sitcom and 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 sort of how that was at that time. Even we're talking what like well into the two thousands, not a fully developed industry in Canada. Um, that's obviously very different than the sort of American context. Um, uh, you know, sitcoms date, you know, sitcoms dating back to, I don't know, you know, the fifties, sixties. Um, so I, what, I guess what I'm curious, you know, based on your understanding of the way things happen, you know, here in the United States, I mean, do you think a show like, 
you know, Little Mosque on the Prairie could have ever really been made in America? And, and if not, why not? I think the United States has a very um, set formula for the types of television shows that they have on. I mean, you you know, the, the trajectory of trying to get a television show made in the United States is basically you have to pitch to executives and they have to feel comfortable with your pitch. And the way they feel comfortable with your pitch is that it reminds them of a show that's currently on television already or that you're somebody who has a lot of seniority and has had a huge hit and they're willing to take a chance on you. Uh-huh. And television in the United States is very secular, right? I mean, the shows like Seventh Heaven and Touched by an Angel are becoming more and more rare on mainstream networks. And so Hollywood is known for very secular, you know, um, very white until recently television. So a show like Little Mosque in the Prairie, which is about faith and has diversity, you know, the, the leads aren't white, you know, talking about religion. I mean, that show would have been, I think, too difficult a show for an American network to air. And, you know, um, Fox had bought the format rights, but they were trying to Americanize it and change it and sanitize it really of its religious content. So I don't know what it would have ended up being had they gone forward, but it would have been a very different show than Little Mosque in Canada. So is is the C, is, so is the CBC sort of our equivalent of public broadcasting? So is that like P, our, our, our PBS here, here in America? Yeah, very much so, right? So we have CBC, then we have CTV, I mean, obviously, you know, we don't, you know, you're a country of 300 million people. We're a country of 30 million people. So right, right, right. The right. population. And so our, and our, and our media is dominated by the American stations because, you know, we're, we are your neighbors. We speak English. We share the same culture, more or less, except for the craziness, <laughs> the gun culture. Right. So, so that well, stuff. So we are your biggest audience outside of the United States. And so it, it really hurts our ability to make television for our own people because it's hard to get eyeballs off of American television stations and onto Canadian television stations. And most Canadians aren't even aware when the Canadian shows are made, you know, because we just don't have the ad budgets that you guys do. So luckily for us, what helped Little Moss and Prairie was that the Americans were so obsessed with the show that, you know, we appeared in New York Times and CNN. And so... Canadians were like, why are the Americans paying attention to this Canadian show? So suddenly the Canadian media started paying attention to us and we started getting an unprecedented media hype that we couldn't afford. And so we had the necessary um, ads to make it to record breaking uh, viewership. So we broke, you know, we broke records. The CBC hadn't had viewership that high since like 20 years previous when they aired Anne of Green Gables. So that's what helped us tremendously. Hmm. Uh, and, and so I guess, I mean, you, you've already kind of sort of alluded to it, but like, so the reaction coming from not only your own, like sort of the Canadian media, but um, as a result of American media was overwhelmingly positive. People were, um, you know, people were sort of uh, listening and, and kind of chiming into the conversations that you were trying to have on the show. Yeah, I mean, it would depend on the episode. I noticed like um, like the Muslim community in Canada had a real was really struggling with the show when it first came out because they were you know you can just imagine in, right. in an age of Islamophobia they had never been exposed to having a television show that represented them before so there was a lot of apprehension and worry that I was doing something that was actually negative and was going to hurt the community and particularly you know comedy comedy is not universal right I mean it's very culturally. Um, contextualized. And so as a Canadian who grew up, you know, as a child who grew up in Canada, my comedy was very Canadian. And so for um, our parents' generation, there was this disconnect, right? Because for our parents' generation, when you make fun of the mosque or people who go to the mosque, you're kind of making fun of the religion. You're mocking, even though you're not making fun of, you know, the sacred in terms of the prophets or God, the fact that you're making fun of mosque culture is somehow wrong and it's they're not used to this and so they were saying she, i was doing something that was inherently un-islamic and, diff- and so it was very difficult for them at first to accept it and so i remember not talking to the media about how my community was taking it because it, you know we were on the heels of the danish cartoon controversy which had happened in 2005 and one of the reasons we were getting so much media attention was because people were waiting for muslims to freak out and blow up the CBC or flip cars and go, you know, go crazy. And they were upset in the mosque. And, and for reasons that at the time I couldn't understand, right? I mean, looking back now, I can understand it. But at the time, I was very kind of confused as to why Muslims were reacting so negatively to the show. 
And, you know, they even said, you know, signed a petition, had me removed from the mosque. And, you know, as, as someone who grew up in the Mina years and in Isna and, you know, was a hardcore Muslim activist, to suddenly be told you can't be a community member anymore, it was just, it was like, you know, I, it, like it threw me off my axis, right? Like I just wow. didn't understand what was going on because I thought, well, this is what we were always told to do growing up as Muslims, right? Make media and go out and push Islam through this way and change up the, the public's opinion on Islam and Muslims. And then when you actually go and do it, the community, you know, turns its back on you. And, you know, so I, it was a very confusing, like, uh, first two years of my life. And that's why I was telling you guys I was glad that I didn't know what was going to happen because, you know, my parents were under a lot of stress because pe their friends were telling them. And then what it was going around the world, like if you were if you were Egyptian, people in Egypt were saying, getting a hold of the Egyptians and Regina going, stop her, you've got to stop her, someone stop her, right? Because there was this mass hysteria in the Muslim world because the news of the show was going around the world, right? And so there was this mass hysteria. And so um, everyone was reaching out to their um, friends in Regina saying, you've got to talk to her. And so everyone was trying to talk to me and tell me what I was doing was wrong. And, and so my my husband gave me the best advice. He's like, you know, people don't understand what's happening. They're panicking for the wrong reasons. And you have to sort of stop reading the blogs because this was before Facebook um, was a thing, before Twitter. So there were just blogs, right? So people were blogging and they're like, you, he's like, you know, you just, you just got to stop reading this and you know what you're doing is right. You know what your intentions are. So just just block it out. And it was good that I got kicked out of the mall, so I didn't go there anyway. <laughs> so, um, and they shot this, the, the television show in Toronto. They, they were, it became such a huge success. It became very political. And they decided not to shoot it where I lived in Saskatchewan. So Saskatchewan is a three hour plane ride from Toronto. So I'd actually actually live in Toronto in a hotel away from my family, away from the Muslim community. And just sort of live on the set. And the set actually faced Northeast. So I could actually pray in the mosque. Um, oh, on wow. the set, yeah, it was sort of like a leg. <laughs> yeah, it's what God gave you a new mosque, your favorite chapter, your own yeah. mosque, your own mosque of one, and so that I would just pray there, and and gradually as the years passed, um, the Muslim community kind of calmed down and realized nothing nefarious was happening. And, and so, my first, yeah, and my first base of um, fans were from people who were born and raised in North America who were understanding what was happening. And we were like a moving target, right? So whenever so a conservative element wanted to say, oh, look, she's, you know, this is what we're talking about. This is how horrible she is. The trouble was the next week there'd be another show and then another show and another show. And they couldn't quite um, get people angry enough because, you know, the shows kept changing. And then people were like, well, actually, that was kind of funny. The last week's episode, I kind of liked that one. And then gradually I was sort of winning over the Muslim community um, over time. And by the time we hit third season, the controversy had pretty much died down. Yeah. No, I, I think you touch on something that we've, you know, uh, you know, having guests on the show who are involved in in, in the arts in very in, in some capacity, just in dealing with the, the, the sort of response from within the Muslim community. Um, unfortunately, one being uh, either guarded at best or kind of the kind of hysteria that you're talking about, which, again, you know, goes back to sort of, again, one of the points that we kind of keep talking about on the show is just that you know whenever we're going to have cultural production or art production of this kind you know it's going to lead to this kind of like messiness it's going it's not going to be pretty it's going to be messy and people are going to have these conversations and there's going to you're going to push envelopes and people are going to have to get out of their comfort zones so i think um i think uh, it, it's it's great to hear you kind of talk about it as well um did you did you feel though that you know and uh, I, I don't mean to like this in no way would impugn you as an artist, but like, did you feel almost sort of compelled or at times compelled to, to, to maybe um, adopt certain, um, I guess, some, some, some sort of filters just because of the response you were getting uh, from the Muslim community? Well, I mean, it, you know, in a weird way, it kind of helped me because, you know, when like the CBC realized how angry the Muslim community was because they had, you know, um, phone the CBC and said, we want this show off the air. So you can just imagine the CBC going, why is the community reacting so negatively towards you? And then, and they were worried about me. They could tell that, you know, it was affecting me and that um, the community had reacted in a very different way. And so when they would come up with ideas that I knew that wouldn't go off, you know, over well in the Muslim community, I could say, listen, you know, um, we have to be cognizant of their feelings and this is really hard for them. So, you know, so I would use that to my benefit because I could, 
get them to understand where I was coming from, right? Because then would say things like, oh, you know, Ryan can just take off her scarf for a season and just experiment. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. Like hijab is a very serious thing in our community. We take it seriously. It's not something that is trivial where you put it on, take it off. Like if you make a decision, you stick with it. And, um, and so, you know, you would have these discussions with them uh, about issues, you know, like like the whole dating issue with Amar and Ryan, and I would say like, you know, we have certain rules, and this is the way we do things, and we have to be honest and authentic to our community. And it helped that the community had reacted so violently because they could understand um, where I was coming from, and they would take my concerns much more seriously than they would have otherwise. So in a, in a weird way, it actually helped me. Yeah, yeah. Well, and and uh, as we talk about you know the, the various characters and whatnot, I mean, can can you talk about the casting process? I mean, you had you had a cast with with Muslims and non-Muslims, and I'm sure that was that was a deliberate choice. Uh, how, how did you how did you decide who, who were the right uh, actors for these roles? It's so interesting, right? Because this is the time before diversity was hot a hot issue. <laughs> yeah, so we didn't have a lot of people to choose from because we're a very small country. Um, the biggest group of actors were the South Asians. They, um, for some reason, South Asians go into art, arts um, and great, and particularly acting in much greater numbers than other other ethnic um, communities in in the Muslim like, diaspora. I don't know, maybe that's changing, but at that time, maybe because of Bollywood. So we had a you know a huge option with um, Amar's role, the Imam, and we were lucky that it turned out to be a, you know a real Muslim, a practicing Muslim. So we got uh, Zayb Sheikh to play him, and then after that. It was gonna, we couldn't find an Arab actor to play Yasser, so we got Carlo Rota, who's Italian, right. and and we got um, Arlene Duncan, who played Fatima, who's Nigerian. She's actually um, Jamaican origin, and then we got Babur, who's actually Hindu, to play uh, Minaj Sood, who plays Min- uh, Babur, who and Minaj is Hindu, and so we had sort of you know a well-rounded cast, for, you know, from different ethnicities. Um, the actress Aliza Valeni played. Uh, Layla, Barbara Zahra, and she's a smiling Muslim. So we had like, you know, this huge, very diverse cast from different faiths, um, ethnicities, all playing Muslims on this show, which was really fun because some of them knew stuff, some of them didn't. And we would learn from the people who didn't because it's not actually easy. You know how people complain about, oh, people aren't praying properly. If you have been trained from birth to play, pray in the line, you have no idea how difficult it now is to get like 30, 40 non-Muslim extras to choreograph all their movements perfectly. <laughs> it's so hard. It's unbelievable. It's almost impossible. So then when I started getting, crit- now I, you know, take criticisms of other shows or they didn't pronounce that properly. They didn't pray properly because it's really, really hard to get to like choreograph those movements in mass, you know, um, groups of people. It's not easy. So at, at what point, do you did did you realize that the show was breaking through? Uh, because I'm assuming that a lot of the initial tune in was the curiosity factor, because you were I mean you you were the the first one through the wall in in, in essence. Uh, how, how many episodes in did it did it did you get the sense that you know we're 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 landing with our audience? I think that when we saw that the numbers were still very high, even after the, I mean, they weren't ever as high as a pilot, but they remained very high throughout the first season. And we were starting to get so much attention from around the world. Like the amount of media interviews I had to do constantly because of the show, because of just the, the curiosity around the world that this show even existed was so intense. Like I remember asking the publicist if she could just slow it down for me because I couldn't, like I couldn't work work both on the show and give all these interviews all the time because it was wow. going to become too much. And I mean, the first year was so crazy. Like I even was invited to Los Angeles and they, and, you know, I got a, an agent in LA and they were asking me to pitch because the show meant so much to so many people on so many different levels um, because it was giving all the LA executives at that time back in 2007 like the, they finally believed for the first time that you could make a television show that had a diverse audience that could cross over to the mainstream and be successful, you know, financially. Like that was something that had never been shown to them before. And like I remember a friend of mine saying, like years later, now that we see shows like Dr. Ken and Blackish and Fresh Off the Boat, they said that you that the show Little Moss on the Prairie had put that seed in their minds because the, the Hollywood executives are watching it so closely. And in fact, I had gone, you know. 
every after six months of production, I would go every year to LA and pitch a show and actually sell it and write a pilot. I did that like for four years in a row for every broad, you know, every network, like Fox and CBS and ABC and C, you know, I was um, writing these pilots that ultimately didn't get picked up, which was a good thing because I needed to be back on Little Moss. But there was this drive and this curiosity that we want to be able to do the same thing that you've done in Canada in the US because it, you've proven to us that it's possible to do. And so I look back now, I wonder like now with all the diversity, you know, that's come up, you know, in American television shows, how much of it had to do with the confidence that Little Mosque in Canada gave those executives that it was possible to do. And we were, we were role modeling this type of, you know, television show. So, I mean, and, and you alluded to this a little bit, but I mean, it, it does seem unfortunate that we have, while we've seen shows that, that are kind of spiritual descendants of Little Mosque, we haven't seen... Uh, a literal realization of, if not an Americanized version of that show specifically, but the idea of a Muslim family or a, a Muslim worldview represented uh, in a more normal sense. I mean, that's something that's remained completely out of reach on American television. It has, and people ask me about that all the time, right? Um, but I do wonder, like, if... If the United States made a show about a realistic Muslim family, then that Muslim family would be grappling with all the issues that ordinary, you know, American non-Muslim families grapple with. And that would be something that the Muslim community would have to come to terms with, right? Because Little Mosque, um, even though they had a really difficult time with it, it still was very, like, Islamic-centered, right, in terms of right. mosque and, and practicing Muslims. But a, a television show with a family would not be. And and so that would be a huge leap, I think, for the Muslim community to see sort of certain realities being reflected, like, you know, teenagers having sex outside of marriage and dating sure. and fitting in. And how would that affect sort of the Muslim response? Like, I do wonder about that, because I think that would be a very different show than Little Mosque on the Prairie. I think Muslims have this hope that Little Mosque would just somehow translate one day into the American network and just be exactly the same. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think we will see something very different. And I think as a community, we're going to have to accept um, that that show will be very different than what Little Mosque will be. But I think that the community has changed and evolved over the years since Little Mosque aired. And I think that they are becoming a much more sophisticated audience. I mean, now you look at England and a show like, you know, Citizen Han. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that show. Have you guys seen no. that show? I, I know of it. I've never seen it. So I've seen it, right? And I went to England when my book came out in England and I talked to um, the actor, who, Adil Ray, who plays the lead character. And he told me that he had actually watched episodes of Little Mosque on the Prairie when they were conceiving the show. Because when I watched um, the show, it was interesting to me because it was, a, you know, it was, it was a show about a Pakistani businessman who is always sort of ruin, you know, kind of trying to insert his, you know, trying to get become like the top Pakistani businessman, but you know, do all these things that have nothing really to do with mosque community or Islam, and yet there's a lot of uh, mosque elements in the show, right? So it's like a family show with two daughters, one wears hijab, one doesn't, but the one wearing hijab is sort of, she sleeps around and does all these things and her, you know, wears tons of makeup and she uses the hijab as um, a disguise to convince her father she's actually very religious and he buys it. So, he, you know, they're sort of um, tapping into some of those things I was talking about. And yet the, the mosque is in there in a way that's almost, um, you know, inserted. And I asked him, like, was that purposefully was well we had watched your show and it sort of gave us these ideas and it's a much more irreverent show than little mosque was and so then i listened you know i was watching all i was reading all the comments when the first show first came out and of course there were exactly the same comments that i had gotten that this is not us this is terrible this is a heresy and then you know one of the comments was it's not a, as respectful a show of little mosque on the prairie Wow. And those were the same people that had criticized Little Mosque when it first came out. And so you're seeing this progression, right? So you're seeing now a show that's much more irreverent and pushing the boundaries um, in a way that Little Mosque did not push, even though for Muslims, they were they felt they were pushed enough <laughs> for them. Right. And so each show will be a progression now, right, where it'll become different and show a different reality of the Muslim community. And I think by the time that show gets to, to air the community will be ready to see it. And if I happen to be that person that makes the show, and I don't know if I will be, you know, there will be elements of sort of a mosque-based community as well as the elements of sort of a non-mosque-based community. Because I think you have to do that in order to represent the reality of what, you know, the type of lives that Muslims lead. 
But I think for its time, Little Mosque was just the right show at the right time because it was, I think, the show that Muslims could handle. Sure. Barely. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and when was the decision made to, to wrap it up? The decision was made in Canada and after it aired, like after six seasons. I think for for places like Canada where we have much smaller budgets and much smaller um, uh, audiences, it becomes much more expensive to make. Like, for example, you know, Friends was a show that went for 10 seasons, but, but at, the la- at the end, actors, the actors, all of them were able to demand a million dollars each for every single episode that was aired. Yeah, they were, they were getting the GDP of a country, I think, by the end of sure. that show. <laughs> they were. And so when Carla Rota, who played Yasser, asked for a raise and more money, the CBC actually told him we couldn't we can't afford you. And he says, well, yeah. in that case, I'd rather be an extra on an American show because I can get way more than being a regular on a Canadian show. And he left us. And so we lost one of our main characters. And we had to, you know, that was when we, the point in last season where we had to write in the divorce. And we realized right. it, was getting, it was getting harder to afford um, to be able to keep the show on air and keep its integrity. So that's when the decision was made that we needed to wrap up our stories. And, and you know, to get six seasons out of a Canadian show was like unprecedented. And it was huge at its time. So... We were pretty sure. glad we got that. Well, so I mean, let, let's you, you mentioned the book. I mean, uh, uh, the, the what what brought about uh, the uh, writing the book, which is which is essentially uh, humorous reflections on your own life experiences. You know what? I was it was shortly after you know it was the year Little Mosque was ending, and I was at a conference. I think it was the Young Presidents Association. It was this conference where you know presidents of organizations under thirty or forty or something like that they were having their conference, and they asked me to speak. And it was so interesting because Urshad Manji was there, sure. and Faisal Al Raouf was there. And this was during the remember, do you remember the controversy with Park Fifty One, the mosque that was supposed to be built in I New do. York City? And I think yeah. it was during some. I think you guys were having not not the some sort of elections. You guys have sort of these elections every two years or every four years. The, the, the midterm elections. The midterm elections, yes. And so you know that's when the Islamophobia really ratchets up. And so that was sort of being used in, in the United States um, against Muslims, like they're they're want to build a mosque, right? You know, in nine eleven and. What are they trying to do? They're disrespecting us and we're letting terrorists win. And so there's all this discourse. And so um, Faisal Raouf is there and Urshad Manji stands up in the middle of her talk and starts to yell at Faisal Raouf, Faisal and says to him, would you invite Salman Rushdie to your mosque? You've never, ever answered me publicly. And so then he stands up and, and he starts to yell at her. And the two of them are like yelling at each other and the organizers are freaking out, right? Hmm because it was getting really loud and violent and i was supposed to follow that <laughs> <laughs> and then i got on and i don't know i made some jokes about terrorists and uh, my clothing which was like coming apart and 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 sort of helped diffuse the situation and then i remember thinking to myself oh my god right the only reason this woman is up there screaming and yelling at him is because she wrote this book you know and if that's what it takes to get people's attention then i can write a book so i got a hold of my agent and i said i want to write a book how do I do it? And she was, okay, well, then you're going to need a literary agent. And then she got a hold of Samantha Haywood from Transatlantic in Canada, and who happened to be the, you know, the ex-agent of Rashad Manji, um, ironically. Oh, wow. And so she said, okay, this is what you have to do. You have to write an outline. Then we submit it to all the publishers in Canada, and then we see. So I wrote an outline on you know, this very serious book about you know, Islam and misunderstandings, And because I thought I was going to write this intellectual book that would end all books about Islam and you know, write all <laughs> the wrongs, you know. And so I wrote it, um, and my editor at the time, Harper Collins, said, wow, this is, like, so bad. This is, like, unpublishable, right? Oh, no. <laughs> and so I was like, but why? And she's like, you know, listen, you write comedy, you write story, you write sitcoms. Why are you writing this, like, pseudo-intellectual book when you're not an intellectual, right? <laughs> Which is hard to Ouch. hear, right? Because that's <laughs> the, um, the grass is always greener on the other side, right? Because all the comedy writers want to write that, those heavy-hitting intellectual books that people will take seriously and wind up on the New York Times, you know, bestseller list, and you'll wind up on Charlie Rose. And... Meanwhile, all the intellectuals just want to be able to write a joke. And so it took two years of them going back and forth saying, no, you've got to stop with this pretension that you can write something intellectual and just write story. <laughs> and so I, we had to rewrite the book like for two years. It was horrible um, and painful, and I cried all the way through it. And so in the end, what you have now is this book, where, which, you know, if you could kind of see the original intent of what I was trying to do in the in the various chapters, but ultimately it's written in a comedic sort of sitcom format where beginning, middle, end story. Um, so that was a very torturous process for me, writing this book. But a, but a rewarding one, I'm sure, based on the reaction you've been getting from from uh, people you've met and reviews and whatnot. 
Yeah, I was really surprised. Even my editor. <laughs> you know, when you write a book, you have no idea how it's going to be perceived. And sure, you're so scared that you're going to be like, like, you know, shown up as a fraud. And so when the first review came out in the Toronto Star, it was, it was incredible, right? Because he was just going on and on about, you know, uh, how much he loved the book. And it blew us away. And my editor kind of looked at me. And she goes, yeah, I, I guess it's a good book, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it was, you know, we had not no idea how it be how it would be received by anyone so it was really hugely surprising that people liked it and and gave us positive reviews well i mean you know i i was uh sort of re you know i've been reading some of the chapters and and uh, you know one i want to commend you sort of talking about i think some real issues you know um well one just i think kind of really making it biographical that i mean you know that alone must be sort of I don't know, just, you know, a little bit of uncomfort, you know, a little bit of discomfort because you're having to share kind of your own experiences, but the way you're able to universalize them. And then also to, the, you know, in the sense that anybody can relate. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you're, 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 you're tackling some, you know, I think some really hefty issues in there. You're talking about, you know, sexual abuse, you're talking about all kinds of things. And, and I, so I think it's, um, it, it's really, uh, I think a remarkable work. I've been really enjoying it. Um, and I think that it's, uh, again, kind of continues in the vein that you wanted to do on the show, which was to have these uncomfortable conversations for Muslims, um, and allow us to kind of just, yeah, I mean, share our experiences. So it, it was, it was it's, it's been a great read so far. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's been the biggest surprise for me. And I don't know why it keeps surprising me when people tell me it's universal and they can relate, right? Because I guess when you grow up in your own cultural community, you think that you, right. your own community is like, they must be like the biggest whack jobs ever <laughs> you know, invented on the planet. And you don't think anyone could ever tell you stories that could top yours. And yet they do, right? <laughs> they do. And, and so you realize that in the end, like all our experiences are pretty much the same all over yeah. the world no matter where we grow up. And that was, the, that was the, weirdly enough, the strangest lesson I've learned making the show and writing the book is that you can write very specifically about your community and it can be relatable to someone halfway across the world that didn't even know Islam existed. And, and, and they can gain something from that, which just really surprised me. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so the, uh, and then again, um, any sort of follow up, plans to sort of, you know, with regards to continuing the conversations you started in the book? Well, I'm trying to write a second book. I'm trying to write a novel, um, which is also really difficult because it's a different, um, even though I'm, I'm a comedy writer, I keep jumping genres and each genre has its own rules and people, you know, spend their lives um, perfecting those rules. And so it's the first time I'm writing a novel. So I'm learning about how to write a three act story tr structure in a long form because I'm used to writing like very short 20 minute comedy Episode, you know, episodic television. So I'm writing a comedy um, about a Muslim woman, and again, very, you know, very much drawn from my life and my experiences about a Muslim woman who writes a book and is really upset that it's not becoming number one on the New York Times <laughs> bestseller list. And so she inadvertently um, joins a homicidal kind of Muslim inter Middle Eastern cult group and causes an international incident. And so I'm sort of working out sort of what's happening in the world around us in in a story form and trying to process the world through this novel um, that will hopefully be re really recognizable to a lot of the listeners of this show. Well, nice. And, uh, and the, the name of the book is Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, The Misadventures of a Muslim Woman. And uh, Zarka, thank you so much for coming on and hanging out with us. Do you, do you have a, a Twitter handle or whatnot that people can, can track you down at online? I do. I'm at, um, at Zarka Nawaz, spelled exactly like that. I believe you guys say Z instead of Z. Yes. Um, <laughs> so Z-A-R-Q-A-N-A-W-A-Z. -A -A and I have a website, um, ZarkaNawaz.com. And I wander around. I, I'll be coming to New York uh, next week. This week, are we? What day is it, you guys? Is it Tuesday? Is this going to be yeah. airing live? I, I, not live, but today. No. Uh, we, we'll, we'll be dropping this uh, a week from Friday. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, by then I'll be in New York, so um, attending some panels, the comedy panel in New York City, and um, I'll be at the Saja Iftar. Have you guys heard of the Saja Iftar? No. South, South Asian Journalists Association. Oh, interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I'll be there um, in New York City. I'll be I'll be speaking at um, New York City University at IFTAR on. Um, Oh God! Next next week. I'm I'm thinking. How do I tell you guys without messing up? Um, I should give you a date, right? A date. That would help. <laughs> oh my God! It's next. I think it's the 14th, but I don't have my calendar on me, and my people will kill me if I'm screwing this up. For those of you who are in New York City, ask them if when Zarkanawaz is speaking at the Iftar dinner. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah. yeah. And uh, uh, so big, big thanks for, for coming and hanging out with us. And we hope you will uh, come join us again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, you guys. Perviz, you want to close out the show? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just again, um, thank you for listening. Um, would appreciate your feedback and comments. Um, always do. And uh, you can hit us up on, um, I'm sorry, you can send us an email with your thoughts and your questions and feedback, uh, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can always uh, engage us on our Facebook page, um, although we keep saying that, but no one takes us up on it as much. Um, so, feeling a little lonely out there. It's like tumbleweeds blowing on that page. Come on, guys. So, um, you know, to definitely engage us there. Uh, you can leave us a review, star rating on Stitcher Radio, iTunes, and wherever else you can find your uh, favorite podcast. And with that, on behalf of Pervez Ahmed, my name is Zach Yelson. This has been Diffuse Congruence. We hope you're enjoying your Ramadan, and we will catch you in our next episode. Thanks for listening.